Welcome back everybody to our studies in AQA A-Level History. Now in continuation of our examination of democracy and participation, we're going to examine over the next three lessons the significance of the Chartist movement, the suffragettes, and the suffragists. This is all part of the, the sort of general development of democracy, the ways in which universal suffrage has uh, been acquired over time and the various different movements that were created in order to establish this idea of uh, universal suffrage. So in this line of reasoning, then, we're going to talk in this lesson about the Chartist movement. We're going to talk about the significance of the Chartist movement. We're going to talk about its legacy. We're going to examine what it was fundamentally, as well as talk about some of the key events which you might want to cite in your essays as examples of what the Chartist movement actually did. So, as an introduction, the Chartist movement in Britain um, spanned a period of around 10 years from around 1838 to 1848. And it was mainly a working class movement which was aimed at the achievement of political reform and addressing economic injustice. Now, one of the main elements of this movement was, of course, the idea of achieving rights in elections and suffrage um, for, for people who are particularly working class, for people who are disenfranchised by the system. Now, it emerged in response to widespread economic hardship and social inequality, which began to take shape and began to develop as the Industrial Revolution developed. You have poor working conditions during this time, you have low wages during this time, you have unemployment, and you have homelessness, um, and essentially life for a working class individual wasn't particularly great during uh, the 1830s and 1840s. Now, this all came about despite the reforms of the Great Reform Act. So the Great Reform Act is where we began our history of democracy in the UK previously, which, of course, began and was passed at least in 1832. But even as late as, late as 1832, many working class people were still very much disenfranchised. The act itself benefited mainly the middle classes, um, people who had the ability to own certain amounts of property. And so the working classes had very little, if any, political representation as the result of the Great Reform Act. And so it would take subsequent pieces of legislation, as well as lobbying the government in order for the working class to actually be able to have have a certain amount of political enfranchisement. The Chartist movement is influenced by the People's Charter of 1838. This essentially outlined six key demands. The Chartist movement derives its name from the People's Charter of 1838. The six key demands were as follows universal male suffrage. They argued that all men over 21 should have the right to vote, regardless of whether or not they had or did not have uh, property or property rights. They wanted to see the introduction of a secret ballot. The voting should be conducted secretly uh, to prevent bribery and intimidation in elections. There should be no property qualifications for members of parliament. This is something that we didn't exactly touch on in the previous lesson. But one of the things that was going in the previous lesson is, in addition to having property qualifications for those who had the right to vote, there were also property qualifications for those who were members of parliament um, who wanted to stand as candidates. And so, according to the Charter, uh, the People's Charter, there was the demand that candidates for parliament should not be required to own property. There was also the requirement that members of parliament should receive a salary um, to enable working class men to serve. One of the things that clearly was a problem during this time period was that because MPs didn't have a salary and because MPs had property qualifications, it meant that it was generally middle and upper class individuals who would be then be uh, entering into Westminster. The fact that there was no salary for members of parliament meant that working class men would not have the ability to serve given that they were working class. And so they had to work rather than to um, represent uh, their constituency in parliament. <laughs> 
There was also the requirement of a equal electoral district, which essentially was just the demand that constituencies should have roughly equal populations and fair representation. And then finally, there was the demand for annual parliaments. Elections should be held every year to increase this accountability. Um, this was uh, arguably the least popular demand. It, it would be particularly unpopular even today, given uh, the uh, turnover that takes place when it comes to general elections and given the fact that a government probably wouldn't be able to uh, actually get much done if they have to do an election every single year. In terms of some of the events that they are responsible for or were involved in, we have a couple that I am going to cite here. Firstly, there's the 1839 Newport Rising. Um, this Newport Rising was a significant and in fact quite violent episode where a number of Chartist activists had clashed with troops in Newport, Wales. This actually then resulted in several deaths and warrants for the arrest of several individuals. The event also highlighted the movement's potential for um, utilizing violence in the in the in the achievements of their goals and therefore showed and represented a certain potential for militancy um, during this period. In 1842, the Chartists were also involved in what was known as the Plug Plot Riots. These were uh, a number of riots and strikes um, in and around particularly the north of England as the result of economic downturns and cuts and uh, slashes in people's working class wages. Um, they began as strikes and then turned and morphed into a number of riots. Striking workers, in fact, started to remove plugs from factory boilers, stopping the production, hence why it gets the name of uh, the Plug Plot Riots, again influenced by the Chartist movement. So you can see that they were particularly militant in certain areas of their, uh, or at least in certain parts of the country. Um, but what about their legacy? Well, fundamentally, in the short term, the Chartists didn't achieve their immediate goals. In fact, during the peak years of the Chartist movement, the, none of the six points that were part of the Charter's demands were actually implemented. But it's not necessarily the short-term achievements that the Chartist movement is remembered for, but it is more so being sort of ahead of the curve, if you will, in terms of laying the groundwork for future reforms. Most of the Chartist demands eventually get realised, albeit a few decades later. So, for example, universal male suffrage, the first demand um, for all men over 21, was achieved in 1918. The secret ballot was introduced in 1872. The idea of property qualifications for members of parliament, this was abolished in 1858. The salaries for MPs were introduced in 1911, and equal electoral districts became a reality with a number of reforms that were started to be introduced into the 20th century. It was only really the final of these demands, the demand for yearly elections, that have not materialised in terms of reforms to the electoral process. And this is perfectly fine, given that there are reasons why we wouldn't want to have elections every single year. And it was also the least popular of the demands that the that the Charter actually implemented or actually sought to see get implemented. <laughs> 